Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our special guests. Thank you for being here with us. I also uh, greet the audience of our today's webinar. Uh, today, uh, we will talk about civil society in Poland and its development after 1989. Uh, our guests uh, today are eminent outstanding specialists, mostly sociologists who are socially engaged. Uh, so welcome Professor Elżbieta Korolczuk, uh, uh, who is a sociologist, works at, at the Sodaton University in Stockholm, and also is a lecturer at the American Center Studies at the University of Warsaw. Uh, she studies social movements, civil society, uh, gender and parenting issues. Uh, Professor Korolczuk is also a social activist and, and public intellectual. Uh, uh, Esbieta has recently published a widely uh, commented book, Anti-Gender Politics in Populist Moment from Rutledge uh, last year. Uh, so once again, uh, 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 nice to have you uh, with us, Esbieta. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Grzegorz Piotrowski, uh, currently implementing a project on anti-racist mobilizations in the countries of Baltic Sea region. Uh, Grzegorz also works as a researcher at the European Solidarity Center in Gdańsk. Uh, for years, he has been dealing with the issues of civil society, as well as the transformation of political and grassroots movements. And since 2019, he's also associated with University of Gdańsk, where he is uh, assistant professor at the Institute of Sociology. So uh, welcome, Grzegorz. And finally, uh, Stefan, uh, Stefan Paweł Zawenski is a sociologist and social philosopher associated with uh, the School of Social Science uh, at the Polish Academia of Science. Uh, Dr. Zawenski was also a fellow at New School in New York as a researcher at the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies. Uh, he's interested in postmodern power structures, sources, and functions of the liberal organization of social reality and the role of classic republicanism in European culture. He's also author of, let's say, almost classic book, uh, classical book, uh, neoliberalism and civil society from 2012. Uh, I would like to add that this uh, webinar is carried out as part of, of a grant, uh, Public Diplomacy 2022, awarded by Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the Center, Center for Europe at the University of Warsaw in order to promote uh, Poland in Western Balkans. Now, uh, a, a small note, as, as I've already did, uh, please do not take the word uh, promotion too literally. Uh, rather, the, the point is to share with the inst international public uh, opinion about various, often complex uh, experiences of, of building the, structure, the structures and, and culture of civil society and, in a post-communist state that Poland was and perhaps uh, still is. Uh, we would like to uh, learn about uh, Polish successes and, and failures in, the, in this area, and of course, discuss the conditions of, of, uh, of this civil society today. Uh, OK, now, if you, uh, if you agree, I would like to start with, uh, with some preliminary and general remarks about the, the, the subject of, of our discussion. Uh, just to be sure that we're talking about, the, uh, the, about more or less the same subject. Now, uh, first of all, by, by civil society, I, I mean here, I will take this, let's say, classical definition the space of, of activities of institutions, organizations, social groups, and individuals, but also informal social movements that extend between family 
the state and the market where people undertake a free debate on the values uh, that make up the common good and voluntarily cooperate with each other for the pursuit of common interests. Now, such a working definition means that there are actually uh, four main issues or groups of issues usually uh, taken into consideration. And I suppose we will be talking also about them. Maybe not literally, but probably uh, uh, this context is important to, to, to be clarified. So, uh, so uh, first is structures of civil society. Uh, structures that is the uh, that is uh, resources uh, um, uh, infrastructure institutional forms degree of citizens involvement uh, secondly uh, these are values of civil society and uh, just like just like profit for business or law for the public sector uh, the democratic or liberal democratic values that is human rights are of particular importance in, in, in civil society. Uh, thirdly, uh, environment of civil society. This is a complex, of course, issue, but when we talk of environment of civil society, uh, we usually think of cultural patterns, legal environment, political context, including political freedoms, freedom of the press, freedom of association, quality of law, a level of corruption, state effectiveness, level of decentralization, access to public information, cooperation with other sectors such as state administration or business, tax regulations, etc. So the environment is a pretty huge, pretty huge issue, of course, a bunch of issues. And finally, uh, the role of, of civil society, that is the importance of civil society for solving social problems, um, its effectiveness in, in real impact on the shape of the law and the functioning of the state authority. And uh, so structures, values, environment, the role of civil society, these issues are related problems. Uh, they often appear in various civil society indexes that are uh, very popular in, in these days. We have Civicus Monitor, CSO, Sustainability Index, other indexes. Certainly, any attempt to uh, describe the phenomenon of civil society uh, usually takes these categories into account. Today, uh, however, uh, I would like to adopt uh, uh, with you a more descriptive perspective related to, let's say, key moments in the development of, of civil uh, society in Poland. Uh, and, I, and I have divided these moments a little bit artificially into, let's say, uh, three, uh, uh, into three. And the first one uh, would be, uh, would be uh, the first attempts to build civil society after 1989 and, and um, uh, uh, let's say the civil society in the first uh, phase of democratic uh, transformation. So uh, uh, I, I wish we could uh, concentrate in the beginning, uh, yeah, at this at this particular moment. Uh, then uh, uh, it would be, I think, useful to talk about the the, the consolidation of of civil society, which I suppose is also related. Uh, not only to, let's say, political uh, uh, and, and social development of, of, of Poland in, 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 the, in the beginning of the millennium, but, but also uh, related to access uh, of Poland to European Union, which makes an important context as well. Uh, and finally, uh, I think we can we can talk of something like deconstruction of, of, of civil society. I, I'm not sure whether it's the best term, but uh, but uh, I, I would like to take it as a as a descriptive uh, word to uh, to uh, comment on on current phase of uh, 
um, of both intentional and unintentional rebuilding uh, of civil society. Uh, so uh, uh, now I would like to uh, uh, start with, uh, as I said, with, with these beginnings and, and ask uh, Stefan Zawenski to uh, to take the to take the um, to take the floor and start uh, um, uh, this story. Uh, um, let me just uh, uh, let's say ask uh, what was this starting point? Why civil society was considered uh, so important in in the transition process? Um, uh, uh, why it was so difficult in the beginning? And uh, do you agree with this concept of, of, of the social vacuum that apparently existed between the family and the state, um, that the predominant paternalism and uh, the so-called helplessness or learned helplessness of homo sovieticus were the principal problems of that, of that moment? Uh, at that starting point in 1989, was civil society really uh, an exclusive club of dissident elite uh, as it is uh, represented sometimes? And, and what happened next? So Stefan, please be so kind and, 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 and start this story if you can. Thank you very much uh, uh, and welcome. Uh, I would like to start from the uh, uh, quick quick historical analysis of the transformation of the meaning of the concept of civil society. I start that social vacuum thesis was published in 1979, when Polish state was intensively trying to take care of and control uh, as many social spheres as possible. So it is not so derogatory finding. However, it was very short period uh, undermined quickly by uh, solidarity uprising uh, and this solidarity uprising is also one of the founding myths of contemporary neoliberal civil society propaganda the the other myth uh, that is connected to this uh, uh, social vacuum thesis is that intermediary bodies are uh, uh, important part of the uh, society. And this is part of the interpretation of the uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, however, uh, it's basically not true. Uh, uh, for Tocqueville, intermediary bodies uh, belong to the old aristocratic feudal societies. For him, uh, modern democracies were characterized by the a high level of the concentration of power, uh, of, of centralization of power. The other myth about Tocqueville, also very often present in, in the uh, academic discourse, is that uh, for him associations are grand free schools of democracy. Uh, there are some mistakes of uh, English translations. There are a lot of more than 11 English as translations, there is always the same uh, mistake where the word gratuitous uh, uh, schools is translated as free schools. So for Tocqueville, the proper interpretation is, is that political associations, that is political parties, are grand gratuitous schools of associating. Uh, where people can re, uh, uh, learn uh, uh, how to associate with other people and then risk their property and money in civil association understood as uh, business enterprises. In French, uh, this uh, understanding of civil associations as uh, uh, business enterprises comes from the French civil code enacted uh, by Napoleon Bonaparte at the beginning of 19th century. And in French civil code, we have the whole chapter on civil society, societe civile, basically about such a simple uh, form of uh, 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 business enterprise. And this understanding of, of uh, civil society was further developed by Hegel, who said that 
uh, opposite to the classical Republican uh, understanding of uh, state as political community, as political society, as civil society, uh, we should think about state uh, uh, as something more abstract, just uh, it's not something that can be uh, developed from the uh, union of people just. So for him, uh, uh, this abstract form of uh, 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 state was something separate from the civil society as a sphere of uh, private uh, businesses, private uh, contracts. Uh, so since Hegel, uh, till the uh, uh, solidarity revolution, the understanding of civil society, modern understanding of civil society was were in opposite to the political society, that is uh, as a economic society. Civil society uh, since times of, of Hegel were the synonym of the economic society. And this is uh, most visible in Alexis de Tocqueville, who was contrasting political society and civil society, political associations and civil uh, associations. Uh, the myth about uh, solidarity is the one of the founding myths of the uh, contemporary discourse on, on civil society. Thus, we, uh, uh, we inherited uh, contemporary discourse from the reinvention of uh, the concept of civil society by, by uh, solidarity. However, when we make a research on the uh, quite a huge body of, of uh, texts left by solidarity of publications, newspapers, uh, documents, and uh, above all, above all program of, solid, of solidarity and act in, in October 1999 at the first national convention of delegates uh, in Gdańsk. Uh, there is nothing about civil society. Instead of that, uh, solidarity developed the discourse the concept of self-governing republic and the main uh, postulate that solidarity uh, was fighting for were workers' councils, uh, uh, employee councils, and various councils uh, uh, of territorial character, basically repeating the basic uh, uh, achievements of the uh, Soviet revolution. Workers' councils is simply Soviet. Uh, so uh, it was not solidarity, but uh, uh, what is very surprising, the reinvention of the discourse of civil society uh, we, uh, we inherited from communist propaganda in Poland, uh, especially intensive uh, in 1989 after the third national theoretical ideological conference, uh, during which uh, communist uh, intended to build new ideological order for the times of transformation. And there the concept of civil society want, was introduced for the program needs of the party. The conference lasted till uh, February 5th, 1989. And the next day started round table negotiations with Eden on June 5th, 1999. These two months were characterized by intense presence of the term civil society in, in official regime press. Most often it was accompanied by the term state of socialist parliamentary democracy as a blend of civil society and the state of socialist parliamentary democracy. So it was communist propaganda that connected concept of civil society with the sector of social or non-governmental organizations. Uh, civil society was, uh, propagated as a politic, apolitical sphere of free activities of citizens, separate from political engagement of, uh, 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 of, of in, in political field, and thus postponing political changes. Uh, during roundtable uh, negotiations, uh, civil society became popularized by media around the world, 
relation uh, 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 events in Poland. And uh, 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 those connecting this phenomena to the uh, 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 phenomena of third sector of non-governmental or non-profit organizations. Uh, on the practical level uh, uh, in Poland, growth of NGO sector became part of propertization of nomenclature, communist, not solidarity, at least. What is visible in high numbers, up to 40% of sport organizations in post-communist countries, not only Poland, uh, where many former apparatchiks found uh, economic safety after uh, transformation. Uh, so rapid development of third sector of NGOs in Poland uh, landmarks globalizations of the process that already started in developed countries, uh, especially USA, from uh, the beginning of 1980s. NGOs were uh, promoted then as alternative to welfare state institutions, as element of neoliberal attack on welfare state, progressive taxation, as state regulator regulations of economy. After 1989, these policies were globalized as part of structural adjustment programs, which in Poland is known as Balcerowicz Plan. In effect, the growth of NGOs numbers is correlated with growing economic inequalities, precarization of uh, swath of society, growing numbers of price on inmates, visible especially in USA, but also in Poland as well. Also, uh, Achieve, main achievements of solidarity were dismissed. Uh, we observed decline in lab, labor union participation and decline of workers' councils, meanings, uh, and uh, numbers, which were major achievements of solidarity functioning effectively in uh, 1980s. Uh, so NGOs became, uh, uh, in this new neoliberal order, agents of dividing society, of economic polarization uh, uh, of Polish society, visible especially between rural, rural and urban areas. Most of the organizations are concentrated in urban areas, serving mostly to live in their middle class. On the one hand, we have very small number of underfinanced organizations helping poor. On the other hand, we have well-financed uh, organizations uh, by conservative oligarchs from abroad, specializing in pro pro propagation of conservative nationalist or un unregulated market ideas. Rich people donors are uh, usually conservatives. Uh, however, most NGOs depend on governmental finances uh, and grants. This is especially visible in uh, developed countries. Uh, in developing countries, the situation is a little uh, bit different. And that was uh, in Poland in the 1990s, before Poland joined the, the European Union. Uh, in developing countries, uh, most of money uh, coming to the third sector uh, uh, flow from abroad, from uh, foreign uh, uh, governments. Uh, so it's still the governmental uh, money, but uh, foreign governments. Uh, and in this sense, the uh, Russian, for example, policy to uh, call uh, such organizations are foreign agents uh, is basically uh, 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 true. Uh, Poland, uh, since the uh, uh, 2014, uh, where we joined uh, uh, European Union, uh, uh, has uh, economically uh, uh, made uh, a lot of progress. So now Polish uh, non-governmental organizations are financed uh, in huge amount by the uh, 
local uh, Polish governments uh, and uh, local governments on the uh, various levels. Uh, but there are still uh, uh, some sources of uh, money uh, from abroad uh, through uh, various mechanisms uh, uh, of European Union above all. Uh, what, what I would like also to describe the part of NGOization, which is a part of the uh, attack of, on the institutions of welfare state, is also a part of the pacification of political movements. Uh, this is visible when uh, 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 organizations are forced by the grant policy uh, to change their objectives from advocacy to service provider, uh, uh, to service providing. And this is the main uh, uh, point of the uh, uh, grant uh, regime. Uh, Non-governmental or organizations to great extent uh, uh, play a role of the service providers of, of various social uh, services. All, uh, especially in the uh, developed countries. In other countries, this situation is uh, more feeble because the uh, money comes uh, uh, from uh, resources from abro abroad that are much uh, smaller uh, than the, uh, in the developed countries. However, Poland, as, as I already observed, has developed from, from these situations. And now we have the mixed regime of financing of uh, non-governmental organizations. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Well, uh, just just one, one comment. Thank you for, for this uh, very interesting uh, theoretical, pretty theoretical point of view. Uh, well, if the, if the, as you said, if the communist, uh, uh, if the communists are in big part responsible for the for the creation of this uh, concept of of civil society, then uh, one could imagine that uh, it was pretty uh, finally a pretty elitist uh, concept at that at that time. But uh, in 1999, Eckert and Kubica, uh, the uh, Polish sociologists, examined uh, the beginnings of the development of. Of civil society from from a little bit different angle uh, from perspective of, of of social protests and movements, and um, they they did not treat uh, this phenomenon so uh, in in such uh, let's say elitistic um, terms a, a strictly elitist phenomenon as, as you did. Uh, uh, nor uh, as merely a sector of, of, of non-governmental organizations and uh, associations. And uh, 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 as a result, they argued that uh, uh, the degree of social mobilization uh, and thus uh, uh, the potential of civil society uh, was clearly greater in Poland than in most post-communist countries. Uh, so this is my uh, this is my my short comment, uh, uh, but uh, but I also would like to um, uh, ask you uh, one thing. Uh, Edmund uh, Edmund Vnuklipinski uh, uh, wrote uh, about the very value oriented very very value oriented ethical civil society. That, uh, that exists in, in, in Poland. It was a feature of, of, of civil society in Poland, probably uh, in general of all quasi-totalitarian or, 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 or uh, ideologized uh, states. Uh, it was also connected with, uh, with the strong position and authority of the church. Uh, do you think, uh, and would you agree that this ethically oriented civil society uh, uh, survived in, in the first years of, of the transformation? Do you think it survived? Sure, uh, because the uh, mere concept of civil society has ethical meaning. Uh, uh, 
quite opposite to the concept of political society, which is uh, uh, more uh, uh, neutral. Uh, we can imagine political uh, society as a, a sphere of fight of various uh, organizations of, um, uh, of uh, various political uh, uh, targets, ideas. Uh, uh, however, civil society from the very beginning uh, seems as, as a, a term uh, very positive meaning. So uh, it was the tool to survive of this political and, and uh, ethical uh, uh, concept. Ho however, uh, as, as I uh, was trying to show, it's basically only the uh, uh, ideology, propaganda of civil society. The real uh, uh, world is completely different. We see uh, that the growth of the non-governmental sector is rather connected to many negative uh, uh, effects, uh, apart from the political movements uh, uh, who are trying to oppose uh, uh, ongoing changes. And because of, of the uh, uh, radicality of uh, changes in Poland. This may be a reason why the uh, social resistance to those changes was so intensive as, as Kubik uh, with his fellows observed. Thank you, Stefan, very much. Uh, in, in, the, in the first decade of, uh, of millennium, a number of obstacles to the development uh, of civil society were identified. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the poor financial situation of voluntary sector, uh, there were lots of legal limitations, uh, uh, the, the, presence, uh, the presence of privileged groups in voluntary sector. Uh, it's definitely, as you said, uh, Stefan, it, it's definitely service-oriented nature, so focused on, on services that state states uh, that state was unable to to provide other problems were emphasized for instance complaints about uh, co commercialization ideologization and client clientelism and in the sector it was argued that the sector grew under pressure from neoliberal patterns and forces on the other hand in 2004 uh, poland joined the eu and it was a huge impulse I think in the also in the development of non-governmental and civic civic sector. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask Grzegorz uh, how these tensions develop at, at that at that time. Uh, Grzegorz, please try to 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 explain it to us. Yeah, I think this is um, when we were talking before. We told you this is a kind of a consolidation or crystallization of the Polish civil society where in the beginning of the uh, 1990s and, and uh, uh, by the end of the 20th century, it was all still in flux and, uh, uh, and very, still very dynamic. Whereas uh, in, uh, in the beginning of 21st century, uh, things began to stabilize. And uh, of course, all these challenges you mentioned were present, but mm, I also think that what, has, uh, what, what had the biggest impact was the way uh, the change of the way we think and speak about civil society uh, uh, then uh, relating to what uh, uh, Stefan Zelensky said uh, um, because the term civil society began to 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 live its separate lives in different worlds in different realms like it, it uh, for some politicians it became a political uh, propaganda slogan um, it, for some people, like uh, political philosophers, uh, it became a political model, but uh, also it became part of reality. But at the same time, uh, it was also uh, kind of a vision, a path that uh, um, parts of the society were supposed to follow. Uh, because uh, when in coming back a few, a few years earlier, uh, when civil society was introduced in centuries in Europe, uh, there were a lot of voices that it was meant as uh, one of the stabilizing pillars of democracy. Whereas with the beginning of 21st century, 
there was no evident threat to democracy, at least not in Poland. Um, there were, of course, some challenges to democracy, but as a system, it began to appear rather stable with a parliamentary democracy uh, being quite functional, despite, of course, uh, some uh, smaller shortcomings. But nevertheless, there was no substantial um, threat to democracy. So this narrative of uh, civil society being one of the foundations of, uh, of democracy um, somehow vanished uh, in thin air and uh, did not come back, uh, at least for a while. Um, what happened uh, uh, was um, that uh, there was also times, like also uh, 1990s, was a part uh, times of hardship, okay, economic hardship, uh, and uh, with, in times of hardship, it's quite natural. Either people uh, go and join protest movements like uh, uh, Ekiev's and Kubik's rebellious civil society, uh, or they tend to withdraw into the private sphere, um, and uh, that was a narrative that also began to be mm, quite popular. Um, mm, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, there was a, there was a narrative, kind of a myth actually, that uh, civil societies in Central Eastern Europe are passive, are uh, demobilized, uh, depoliticized, uh, etc. And for some, for quite a lot of people, it was uh, a direct consequence of uh, Polish experiences with uh, state socialism, with communism, that uh, people were forced to join some voluntary, uh, by name. Uh, organizations, therefore, when things uh, changed, they withdrew to their private sphere and actually focused on um, their private uh, uh, issues, mostly making money, uh, going along with this liberal or neoliberal uh, agenda. And because of that, uh, there, were, there was a number of uh, statistics showing that Polish uh, society is less mobilized, Poles are less active, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But interestingly, uh, uh, there are a lot of areas that were not considered anymore as being part of civil society. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the book you mentioned by uh, Kubik and Eckert uh, uh, was one of the breakthroughs for, uh, in, in that uh, narrative. But uh, there was quite often a very clear division between civil society and social movements. Uh, the one you, try, uh, you, tr you overcame uh, in your introduction to this seminar. But that was quite often uh, the case uh, in, uh, when people were talking about uh, civil society in Poland. And this actually uh, is to some extent visible today. For instance, when I'm teaching, I always, I'm teaching uh, uh, classes on social movements and also on civil society. And I also start with asking people, are they engaged in any way? And uh, usually people say, no, they don't do anything. Maybe one person in a group. But then I start asking, is someone uh, active in some voluntary circles? Is someone active in uh, voluntary fire brigades? And there's always at least three or four people uh, in the group of students that are active, but for some reason they do not consider it as being uh, active in civil society organization. Uh, and voluntary fire brigades are uh, actually one of the biggest uh, civil society organizations in Poland with roughly 900,000 uh, members. Uh, and there's a lot of other areas that were not considered being uh, uh, as being part of the civil society, when this narrative was very much focused on, on the third sector, uh, was very much uh, focused on uh, uh, service provision, uh, which corresponded, of course, with uh, a change in politics, uh, uh, which uh, some uh, scholars uh, uh, even uh, began calling uh, Polish politics as part of post politics, as service provision, as governance, rather than doing politics. And with the state withdrawing from um, another area, one after another, of uh, social services, this was uh, a niche for, uh, for civil society uh, organizations that had to become professionalized uh, and had to be uh, uh, very, very technical at, uh, at least, and also very depoliticized because uh, uh, of the changes in, in the, uh, the financing system. Um, uh, what is also interesting uh, and also 
uh, relating to what, what already has been said, was kind of a um, cut uh, away from uh, the the heritage of Sayyid Darnash. Uh, with uh, all its uh, great mobilization and so on and so on, this didn't become that much of a, um, uh, of a part of the narrative, part of the story, part of the heritage. Uh, it was uh, all, most of the civil society organization, the whole sector uh, began to be modeled after Western European or North American uh, models uh, when it comes to financing, but also when it comes to legal, um, you know, so legal environment they worked with uh, in. But this, this was a little bit like cherry picking because uh, we had a quite well functioning third sector uh, so NGOs, but without a great tradition of civil engagement that was in Western Europe or in the US, or without those levels of, uh, uh, of wealth that would allow to spend more time for voluntary activism or uh, any kind of social activism or activity, in fact. Uh, we also didn't have for, uh, uh, for a long time uh, a clear system of tax deductions that would encourage people to donate money to the third sector, to uh, civil society organizations, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, present, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the United States. And um, that was part of this narrative that I think uh, crystallized uh, in first uh, years of 21st century. The second one was also the change of uh, the language that was used uh, by uh, the NGO people themselves, I mean, by the, the whole sector. Uh, this, uh, this change of language is visible because they uh, grasped a lot of uh, new speech coming from economics, a uh, very neoliberal uh, way of thinking. So it was uh, uh, going from one project to another, uh, trying to establish more effective KPIs uh, when trying to deal with some social issue uh, or uh, the whole audit culture that Jan Grzynski was writing about. Uh, these, these were cliches from uh, language of economics, of liberal or neoliberal economics. Uh, and that, um, uh, that I think also changed the way uh, people were perceiving NGOs. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it already has been said here that it was a slightly elitist project uh, in the beginning. I think that in the beginning of 21st century, this even uh, 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 became more visible uh, because uh, for many people, NGOs were a working place. Uh, it was not a, a calling. It was not a mission. Uh, it was uh, just another uh, solution uh, to the hardships of, of job market. Uh, and of course, a lot of NGOs have uh, fully paid uh, staff, uh, but uh, there was a number of NGOs that were quite visible that actually uh, pushed, it, uh, pushed it really hard. And um, this was extrapolated on the rest of, uh, of the sector. And I think this is why some new phenomena that appeared in the first years of 21st century uh, were not considered as part of civil society. And, uh, just to mention, family-related uh, activism that actually uh, Professor Karolczuk was writing about, um, urban activism, where urban movements at some point uh, began running for in local elections with some uh, moderate success, but still. Um, uh, Right-wing activism that also was now even more prominent, but it began in, uh, in the first years of uh, 21st century. That were not, these were not considered uh, as part of civil society because of the language, because of the uh, of the jargon, uh, and, uh, um, and this also created a situation that uh, there was not much uh, grassroots support for the uh, for the NGO sector. That's why NGOs had to be dependent on funding. And as I said, there were, because of the lack of uh, uh, tax incentives for private donors, uh, what uh, what was left was the local governments or local authorities, central government and multinational um, organizations or supranational organizations like the EU or funds like the Norwegian Fund or those the, uh, other big uh, charity organizations or foundations like, uh, I don't know, Alliance Foundation, Bosch and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but this uh, uh, also um, 
you know, for, as well, made, it, made the NGOs dependent on these sources. Uh, when one looks at the structure of financing of the Polish NGO sector, uh, it, it's very vis clearly visible that there, there are not that many NGOs with uh, diversified income sources. It's mostly grants that are coming from the EU or from the central government or from local governments. And these constitute the vast majority of, of the money that flows through NGOs. But the grant donors also have some agenda, also have some policy. And, and with that policy, they can shape what the society, civil society uh, was uh, dealing with. Uh, so these were a lot of grants for um, um, natural uh, conservation, uh, environmental issues, uh, etc. A lot of uh, a lot of grants also to um, kind of uh, um, even out uh, uh, some uh, educational deficits. Uh, th that uh, things that were often uh, thought that it is the responsibility of the state were taken over by NGOs. Uh, but within these projects, the, uh, the NGOs very rarely actually addressed the core of the problem, which quite often would be political. Uh, it was rather, and that is also visible in research when uh, uh, people were, uh, when uh, most sociologists were asking, about how people feel about the third sector is that they don't uh, uh, address the, the the problem. They just uh, try to pow powder up uh, the outcomes of the problem, uh, which at some point alienated uh, the civil society from the rest of the society in Poland. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, in my notes, I have a quote from uh, Jakub Wydański who said that uh, we wanted to have a civil society, but we had, we ended up uh, with having NGOs in Poland. Uh, and I think this is this is a quote that really nicely sums up uh, uh, this uh, um, this whole process. That um, especially in, in in those years of 2000 2015, uh, more or less, uh, that was uh, mm, that was a change in the nature of uh, civil society, but also the way we think about civil society. As I already mentioned, a lot of groups were, um, were excluded. And what was not helping was that uh, quite a lot of NGOs were quite preoccupied with themselves. With the, with, uh, like there were a lot of grants to educate other NGOs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I myself, am, I'm a vice president of one NGO and I see sometimes grants that are given by the state or by or by a local municipality uh, to an NGO that then uh, uh, offers uh, or organizes a call for applications uh, for, um, for instance, um, some educational program for NGOs, then another NGOs apply to that grant, the money is divided, and then they uh, the, in the third or fourth level uh, down, they do uh, uh, like these trainings or uh, some uh, uh, or things like that. Um, but there are so many middlemen in the uh, in between uh, that it reinforces this uh, this uh, feeling that uh, the civil society is quite often preoccupied uh, with uh, uh, with itself. That is why uh, that especially in the years uh, in the first years of twenty first century. There were not that many attempts to mobilize new people. When they uh, uh, appeared, because uh, quite often people mention the Wielka Orkiestra Świątecznej Pomocy, which is a charitable organization, it was uh, a single day activism. Like once a year you get involved and then it's ticked off and uh, we can go back home. Uh, which some people interpreted as, a, as also a, as, a, as a mechanism to depoliticize uh, the whole sector, so it won't become a political threat uh, to those uh, in power. Um, and uh, uh, as, as you said, I mean, there were other, other uh, challenges, legal challenges, uh, financial limitations, uh, that uh, the, 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 the latter changed uh, with Polish access, uh, accession to the EU, with new uh, funds uh, being available, but still it was the same uh, um, grant-oriented uh, uh, funding mechanism. 
uh, well, actually, when uh, I'm, I'm doing now interviews with uh, people from NGOs, this is one of the mo biggest complaints, one of the most common complaints, that all the money comes with a specific purpose, specific goal, and uh, expectation of um, the auditing and reporting, etc. That you have to meet some, uh, there have to be some milestones, you have to have some deliverables, uh, you have to have some uh, goals reached, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's very rarely that the uh, money, even small money, comes with no strings attached just for the development of the organization or group. And there's also a problem that uh, groups that apply for money have to ha uh, be registered, have to be institutionalized, uh, which was one of the limitations of uh, legal limitations of the financing um, uh, uh, scheme. Uh, uh, and of course, this has changed, but uh, I know that uh, Professor Karosha will be talking about it, but I, I wanted to stress that what has changed was not only the functioning of civil society, but the way we think about it and the way we speak about it. Because uh, when you look at uh, articles, academic articles from the early 20, 21st century uh, that show the low level of involvement, there is a lot of, there are a lot of, lot of activities missing. Like uh, football fandoms, um, um, rural housewives uh, uh, associations, um, uh, the voluntary fire brigades, etc., etc. A lot of things are not included in these uh, in these tables uh, because uh, we changed the way uh, we were thinking about um, the civil society. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grzegorz. Uh, I have uh, one comment and one, one question. Uh, a comment according to uh, a comment about uh, this uh, uh, remark uh, of a new language uh, emerging about civil society. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the political and economic transformation uh, created in the beginning a sort of imperative of effective reforms. Uh, uh, and this and this imperative of effective reforms uh, was in a way at expense of uh, of the use of the society. Uh, some some uh, argue that that uh, this uh, imperative of effective reform excluded the real dialogue from 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 so from social space. Uh, in in other words, uh, the fall of communism, the instability, uh, the need for a new and predictable uh, society, an expert class, and civil society create a, create a special uh, atmosphere of necessary actions that must be undertaken, and uh, I think this uh, imperative. Uh, captured uh, simply uh, captured the, the public's imagination, and, and maybe and maybe now uh, we are uh, releasing it, uh, and maybe uh, uh, this is the moment where uh, where where the this new language is is emerging emerging. We are seeing civil society more and more independently from 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 this from these necessary reforms uh, which in the beginning which in fact were uh, uh, were obvious in the, in the beginning of 90s but uh, but i also have uh, a question um, to you about this uh, uh, let's say depolitization of of uh, of civil society uh, uh, does uh, the so called uh, uh, hostile consensus, uh, that is uh, a, a, a social conviction that the state and society must be always hostile to each other. I, we can call it a hostile consensus. Uh, do you think uh, it, is still, uh, uh, it is still present? And uh, is it a, a, a living, legacy uh, of communism or maybe uh, rather it is uh, 
uh, uh, a legacy or an effect of, of let's say, liberal, neoliberal changes, because uh, free market capitalism uh, not only theoretically aims to limit the role of the state and is uh, also hostile vis-a-vis -vis the state. Uh, and is it ne necessary and possible to put put an end to it or maybe it's over uh, or or maybe such attention is of some value uh, for the for the development of states w what do you think well i think this is a i, I wouldn't connect it strictly with the legacy of communism because uh, even among the youngest generations there is a very strong um, um, distance to the state um, and uh, especially to politicians, because uh, if you look at uh, the uh, rankings of um, um, professions with the highest uh, uh, social trust among the people, I mean, on one, on the one hand, you have um, state uh, uh, functionaries uh, like policemen or firemen that actually have a high level of social trust. But then if you look at the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the of the table, there's usually politicians, local politicians. Uh, uh, now there's also YouTubers and influencers. But uh, um, any professions connected to politics are very, very uh, 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 well treated with at least with reserve. And uh, well, that would be actually my opinion that is happening for a reason. Uh, there is uh, uh, there's there's not much trust. Uh, in politics uh, and the state understood as part of political uh, uh, political uh, life because if you look at the trust towards local municipal authorities etc that is a slightly different thing uh, but i think that this kind of distrust is actually what can be and uh, probably is fueling civil society in poland that one doesn't trust uh, the state to solve a problem, so uh, it's time to take matters in one's own hands. And this is very visible in small communities, uh, in small towns and villages, where the, the, the distances between people, between officials and people are uh, much smaller than uh, in big towns. Uh, but it's also associated with, uh, with uh, 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 part of your comment, uh, which I wanted to uh, uh, to relate to, uh, because uh, this language of uh, that started surrounding civil society and NGOs uh, didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, this was language of efficiency, uh, and there was a quite often uh, heard that uh, state will might solve this problem, but it will be less effective, will be more costly, and uh, so let's give it to NGOs. They will compete. Uh, uh, mostly overpriced. I mean, who can do uh, do it cheaper uh, when applying for a grant? And this will be more effective because it will be in private hands, not the state hands, which uh, is a narrative that actually reinforces this distrust towards the state. Uh, and this is uh, uh, probably that will be a topic for another meeting, another seminar. But why has uh, uh, why there is no narrative uh, reinforcing the trust relation between the citizen and the state? I mean, I know why it's not happening because of the, some of the states and politicians' actions, but why nobody actually uh, goes uh, to, uh, for promoting this kind of narrative? That this is a state, it's stable, it's trustworthy, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, it will be uh, like this solid foundation for social life. No, not, I, I don't know any politician that actually comes with uh, uh, such narrative, and this is actually very interesting. Uh, and this is, I think, part of uh, 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 one of the last remaining parts of the transformation of 1989, that uh, uh, we not only not trust the state, but we're not even, not even encouraged to trust the state, uh, which is in the end, I mean, looking what is happening uh, here and there, it is maybe uh, also some kind of a healthy approach, um, but it's totally different uh, to countries uh, after we modeled our civil society, uh, where uh, the state is much more trusted, like Scandinavia or uh, a lot of countries in Western Europe. It's effectively another issue, and, and it's yeah. more related to political party system. 
because uh, in, in let's say in a, in a well uh, organized uh, political party system uh, that's the task for the for the parties to develop this uh, interconnections between state and and politics and and society but uh, not necessarily okay or, uh, or, sorry, just, just to one last word or to civil servants yeah okay. politicians but also to civil servants okay may, may i add uh, uh, something yes yes please of course uh, why uh, non-governmental organizations are cheaper than the state simply because they pay less their staff so this is why uh, there is a huge rotation of staff in non government organizations mostly women okay thank you uh, thank you stefan for this remark elvieta uh, now i would like to uh, ask you to to tell us something uh, something more about the civil society today. Uh, let me start with this uh, small um, uh, short remark that uh, since 2015, we have uh, law and justice in, in power in Poland. Uh, it is an intense uh, time of, of great ambitions of conservative counter revolution, uh, a time of Redefin permanent redefinitions and or or uh, or reconstruction of various uh, policies, but also a time of huge problems and very uh, heated uh, ideological conflicts. Uh, and uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, civil society plays uh, an important role. In the, in the activities and rhetoric of the party in power, uh, but uh, the ruling class in general seems to be uh, uh, quite divided about whether civil society in Poland is strong and weak or weak. At the same time, what already Grzegorz uh, said, uh, significant changes independent of the of the authorities began to appear within the civil, civil society itself the the forms of its self organization have started to change there are new media new networks internet there are also many unrecognized areas of civil society activities including uh, thousands of uh, of uh, activities and initiatives uh, uh, in form of not in my backyard. So, uh, so what does it look like today, and uh, what's your opinion in, uh, about it? First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this discussion. And it would be really fascinating to engage in a in an exchange because you know I have quite a lot of things, and I guess that's also uh, something which is fascinating because I, judging from what has been said said by by other panelists, it seems that we might have a very different uh, definitions of what civil society is, and this is of course part uh, of course part of the ongoing discussion about whether, for example, grassroots uh, mass movements uh, should be social movements should be included in civil society. In our book with uh, Sherston Jakobson from 2017, I have no doubt that we should. So in that sense, we think of civil society and I think of civil society as a space within which um, you can have very different types of engagement, both uh, formalized such as NGOs, but also informal um, groups, grassroots movements, individual activism and so on and so forth. Uh, and, so forth. and I think the, that technological advancement has also changed the dynamic of the ways in which we engage. So NGOs are, are sometimes only one element of this broader uh, complex field, uh, which we may uh, call civil society or which we can call some you know, other name like you know, uh, civic activism or engagement. Uh, but um, what has happened in Poland during the last couple of years has been very dynamic. And uh, I have only 15 minutes, so I won't be able to tell the whole story, but I will try to point several changes to your attention. Um, because on the one hand, we have a process of vast in institutional change, which is state-led and state-implemented. 
this um, uh, is uh, connected to the process that many commentators and scholars have termed sh the shrinking of civil society space, meaning that the space for civil society actors independent from the state is shrinking in terms of institutional support in terms of financial support and so on. At the same time, we can observe something um, that we can term, um, uh, we, we can talk about in terms of reawakening of citizens. Um, so we can observe the emergence of grassroots mass mobilization, mass movements. Um, we can observe the um, repoliticization of civic engagement, which is to some extent uh, brought about by the, um, uh, by the attempts from the state actors to limit the activities, the freedom of specific types of organizations and networks. Um, so in that sense, we can um, think about these changes as leading to the strengthening of the links, the ties between um, civil society organizations, not only formalized and, um, and citizens. So this is a very dynamic and very uh, complex uh, process. Um, I would like to point out to the several um, elements of this institutional change, because the main promise of the changes introduced by the Law and Justice Coalition in 2015 was to actually bring about um, tools and solutions that would um, uh, change the tendency for, for oligarchization and elitization of civil society. So basically the promise was we will have more money for civil society uh, actors from the state sources. We will uh, make um, uh, new rules which will favor uh, those organizations, those actors that did not receive money before and that have been allegedly uh, underprivileged like conservative organizations or rural organizations and we will uh, bring about more equality more space for engagement uh, and also more equal relations between the state and the, and the and civil society and society in general what has actually happened was um, um, a rather different uh, process uh, one that could be conceptualized in terms of an attempt to uh, to bring about civil society elite change in the sense that um, while uh, the promise to bring more money to civil society organizations have been fulfilled and especially the um, early stage um, tenders and grant proposals were really privileging, um, for example, small organizations from smaller cities. Um, if we look at the ways in which the money has been spent so far during the last six years, unfortunately, it seems that um, the civil society has been uh, subdued much more under the control of the state and the uh, the relations between civil society and um, and um, actors and the state have been much more centralized and have been much more controlled uh, by the ruling party. Um, and uh, one key element of this change was the establishment of so-called National Freedom Institute Center for the Development of Civil Society in 2017. And I think it's it's quite interesting because. This shows how, um, how cautious we have to be when we look at specific um, pieces of legislation um, and regulations. Because um, um, one element which was highly criticized by the time, and this criticism turned out to be valid, was the fact that this, uh, this new regulation was not really consulted broadly within civil society. And actually the process of social consultation took only two weeks, which is unfortunately not abnormal for the, uh, for the um, legislat legislative processes today. But uh, of course it shows that only a very small portion of interested parties could actually to take part in this process. And then, of course, um, if you look at the institutions which resulted from this, uh, from this change, it's also interesting because on the one hand, uh, existing um, uh, bodies, advisory bodies, uh, such as the Public Benefit Council, uh, did not cease to exist. 
it still exists. And actually it has more members also from civil society than it used to have before. But if you look at the, how the whole in infrastructure of the, you know, which, which influences the uh, institutional infrastructure of the uh, civil society and state relationship, which influences these this relationships. Of course, you can see that uh, today it is the National Freedom Institute itself through uh, the Institute's director and the uh, director's council and also the Committee for Public Benefit Activity um, is actually the, are actually the bodies which have, uh, you know, everything to say and they are not, uh, unfortunately, um, open for broad participation from civil society actors, you know, um, um, from different sides of, of, of civil society, let's say. So in that sense, uh, we can see that the ultimate uh, result of the reform was the concentration of power uh, in the hands of, of the ruling party, basically, which is always problematic and which is always um, um, to some degree, something that, that we have to be uh, worried about. But in this uh, uh, particular case, it was connected with two other um, um, processes. One was the process of the delegitimization of the existing um, civil society actors who um, were, let's say, recognized, influential, and so on. And that was connected to smear campaigns um, uh, against individual people and specific organizations, uh, and also uh, changing the structure of financial support for civil society organizations. And I already said about the, um, uh, the changes in the ways in which grant has been managed. Uh, but of course, civil society um, is being um, um, supported from different sources, right? Not only through the sources which are labeled like, you know, civil society grants, but also from, uh, let's say, uh, ministerial sources, such as, for example, Solidarity Fund, which has been, which used to be quite important source for, um, for support, especially for organizations uh, dealing with victims of crimes, such as, for example, uh, as women's organizations helping um, the victims of domestic violence, or uh, people uh, supporting um, uh, minority groups. Uh, the same situation was with the Ministry for, uh, for Foreign Affairs, Affairs, which has been financing organizations helping migrants and refugees. And this, uh, this money has been cut quite abruptly and, um, you know, including some changes in the rules of the game um, during the tenders. And in that sense, you could see how um, this, this broad reform have a very clear ideological angle. Uh, so it is, I would say, um, um, a very well uh, concerted, well prepared effort to actually strengthen organizations which are labeled as conservative, representing patriotic values, uh, representing, um, 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 you know, uh, well, Catholic um, views and so on and so forth, which allegedly were discriminated against under the previous uh, governments. Um, and uh, that of course has uh, very dramatic consequences for many organizations such as uh, said organizations working with migrants, some of them cease to exist. Um, but uh, when I look at uh, women's organizations, uh, this has actually led to restructuring of the sources of financing. Um, and um, in this case, it turned out that having, uh, you know, grant uh, donors or, or uh, organizations helping with grants from uh, foreign sources was a, a life-saving device uh, in, the, in, in the context in which the state is very much against specific groups and specific organizations, which also helps to answer the question why people don't trust the state. Well, some people have very good reasons not to trust the state, especially in such volatile um, um, uh, political systems. Uh, but I also think that um, we should really 
restructure the question because we have been asking for so many years why civil society is so weak why haven't we had you know huge mobilizations why people are not more active and so on and actually during the last couple of years we can see that the polish population has a huge capacity for mass mobilization uh, during the since 2016 uh, until 2020 even under the conditions of total lockdown during covid pandemic we could see uh, the mobilizations uh, of a scale which was undocumented during the last 30 years the protests of mostly young women and also men against um, further restrictions uh, concerning access to abortion uh, were probably the biggest in terms of numbers um, mobilization um, after 1989 and maybe also before um, and we could see a huge capacity of um, uh, of uh, well Polish citizens uh, to create networks, to organize online, to uh, mobilize um, against what they saw as, as a threat to their badly autonomy, to their uh, civic rights, and so on and so forth. But of course, the question is, what happens then? Because unfortunately, these mass mobilizations, even though they managed to stop, for example, legislative changes in 2016, 2017, they did not prevent um, uh, further restrictions in access to abortion, which were introduced in 2020 through the Constitutional Tribunal. So I guess the question we should be asking much more often is how responsive the state is to the claims of civil society actors? How responsive civil, uh, you know, state institutions uh, on different levels are to the organized efforts, formal and informal, by citizens. And I think that this uh, question is, is really key here, uh, because um, um, when we look at the ways in which uh, Poles has, has responded to, um, to the war in Ukraine and to the huge scale of refugee crisis that we are dealing with, uh, we can observe several very interesting trends. On the one hand, we can see how important is, uh, are the local uh, communities, local authorities, but also um, sort, sort of old type organizations such as um, firefighters, brigades, and, um, and uh, local uh, rural women associations. Uh, because uh, and I've heard it from a couple of uh, researchers who have started to study the response of Polish society to the refugee uh, situation, um, Elizabeth Dunn among them. It turns out that at the local level, these organizations were often at the forefront of, uh, you know, first um, and quick response to the situation, you know, organizing uh, reception centers, organizing food, organizing uh, clothing, and so on and so forth. Um, another element which is really interesting is that in the Polish context, um, the support for refugees is, I would say, in 80% uh, of the times, very much privatized, right? So uh, uh, partly because the organizations uh, ha which have helped um, refugees before and which continued to operate um, during the uh, crisis ongoing crisis at the Belarusian border uh, suffer from uh, cuts in funding and lack of uh, institutional support, they try to, uh, um, they, they, are, they often play a key role in terms of um, spreading information, um, providing, for example, legal advice and so on and so forth. But of course, with the scale, uh, their scale of operations, they're not able to actually engage in, um, in um, in the current crisis at the level that is needed. So in a way, it, uh, I, I think that this will be really interesting to, to analyze also in the future. What were the key factors which made this first uh, phase of response to the crisis so effective? Um, and so different from other countries, because usually in other countries, if we have such a scale of refugee crisis, two, three million people, 
this crisis is usually handled by um, international organizations or huge national organizations, which establish refugee camps and so on and so forth. This has not happened in Poland, which also I think is very much a testament to the mobilizational capacity of the Polish, um, of the Polish people, but not necessarily a, a good testament to organizational capacity of the Polish state in response to such crisis. So to just uh, sum up in, in one sentence, I think that what we have now is a very uh, dynamic and very um, interesting um, situation in which we have the state which um, basically picks and chooses which kind of uh, civil society activism and organizations and actors uh, it wants to support and which it wants to suppress. But at the same time, we have a, a huge capacity for grassroots mobilization, and we have um, a very large scale of um, civic response to the crisis which has been brought about by the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elzbieta. I will, uh, let's say, change this arg your argument uh, for the purpose of this discussion. Now, uh, uh, today, uh, some initiatives, uh, some organizations, it's true, are sometimes marginalized or replaced by others. Uh, sometimes they're criticized of being merely uh, quasi-civic, uh, ineffective, immature, irresponsible, or, or simply too liberal, too leftist. Uh, so to change this situation, law and justice in a symmetrical fashion wants to strengthen the government's position in non-governmental sector, which may seem in contradiction with the spirit of uh, NGOs, uh, but also wants to create more space for conservative, for Republican, and often anti-liberal initiatives and organizations, sometimes those overlooked, as you said, uh, by uh, civil society studies. And this is one of the, one of the aims uh, of the National Institute of Freedom you were, you were talking about, and perhaps the reason for creating the governmental uh, non-governmental organizations. I love the, the, the Polish abbreviation gongos uh, for, uh, to describe them. Uh, but as a result, I would like to ask you, uh, has the government uh, succeeded in strengthening the non-governmental sector and shaped it in a more democratic fashion by uh, uh, underlying the importance of these overlooked Republican and conservative uh, movements? My short answer would be no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, but to, to give it a little bit of context, uh, first of all, we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, uh, is the claim that, uh, for example, um, patriotic or conservative organizations, the Catholic organizations were underprivileged during the you know, last 30 years. We have no data to actually support this claim. And actually we have data like, you know, for example, the, the book by, uh, by um, Galia Chimiak, which shows otherwise. But also uh, currently I am engaged in a project which analyzes civil society elites in uh, four different countries, Poland, Italy, Sweden, and UK. And we did a survey uh, in all of those countries trying to um, uh, to uh, establish whether or not we can have a certain uh, number of criteria which would allow us to single out um, organizations which have um, specific, you know, large amount of resources, you know, people who are uh, uh, employed, uh, organizations which have um, been involved in advisory bodies, for example, or which play um, an important role uh, within, um, you know, organizations which play a role of connecting, networking other organizations. And we actually managed to, in, in the Polish case, we single out 31 organizations which have this kind of elite status. And actually out of them, um, 
15 have been established prior to 1989. The very idea that, you know, that um, those organizations which were established through the help of foreign donors after 1989, I mean, we have to really rethink that because I don't think that we have looked, you know, closely enough at this thesis, you know, with data in our hands. So um, I think that we, we really need to, to sort of, you know, take a step back and, and look more critically at those uh, at those truths which were often you know uh, floating around and unquestioned but I also think that um, what the political um, right-wing populist parties such as uh, law and justice do uh, unfortunately is not so much operating under the idea that uh, civil society can uh, and should uh, be um, acting independently from the state, but it's rather operating, um, um, you know, its operations are rooted in the view that civil society is, should be always subdued and loyal to the state. And the state is, of course, represented by the party. So in that sense, um, um, unfortunately, this brings quite, uh, quite uh, problematic effects where organizations who are actually, you know, um, focusing on the marginalized groups um, are cut from founding because they are labeled uh, non, not, you know, patriotic or not socially traditional enough. But at the same time, um, uh, if you look at organizations such as uh, groups, um, engaged in um, uh, economic issues, right? For example, housing um, movements um, uh, against uh, evictions and so on. Those were also not elevated, you know, in the sense of, you know, support or having more voice or having more influence. So I would say that uh, this is a very, uh, very, um, well, exclusive, uh, not inclusive, not anti-elitarist um, um, strategy. And the effect is either pilarization uh, of civil society, so basically separation of specific groups which are ideologically uh, uh, sort of connected or labeled, or actually, um, um, I would agree with Monk said and, and others who claim that populist um, even though they they are uh, apparently uh, anti-elitist, they are rather anti-elitist pl pluralist. So they are really against a specific type of elite, which they want to replace with their own elite. So in that sense, um, even though at the beginning it seemed that it might have, maybe even as a side effect, some uh, good um, good effects uh, uh, for those organizations which uh, didn't receive so much money before and which weren't so visible i don't see this trend um, you know developing from there thank you very much just one remark i think that one of the positive outcomes of this discussion about civil society is that we understand that civil society has a political function and uh, uh, that it always uh, has political, let's say, colors. Uh, civil society is no longer neutral, which was one of the uh, founding ideas in the beginning of 90s. Uh, so we have the right wing and left wing uh, civil society as a result, uh, uh, its various participants are fighting for hegemony. And, uh, and of course, I would, I would uh, ask all of you, well, to, to, to questions. It's, it's very often said that we live in a post-political uh, societies that people are no more, uh, have no convictions or are, uh, are losing their interest for politics. But in this context, don't you think that there is a risk of spreading political conflicts to civil society. And uh, is it good? And, 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 and the second question, maybe we can leave these questions without responses, but, but more I think about 
civil society and its and its political uh, involvement and its polarization, especially the the last years, uh, more ambivalent uh, responses I do have in my head. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm wondering uh, whether we can speak today of any comprehensible ideal of citizenship in general. So uh, listen, uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for, for this uh, d d discussion. Uh, thank you for, uh, for, your, uh, uh, for your time and, and interesting uh, remarks. I hope to see you uh, soon in, in another context. Maybe we'll have opportunity to talk other important issues, including, uh, in, including the role of political parties Maybe and maybe next time, uh, 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 idea of Jagosh is, is is pretty interesting and and uh, uh, thank you again and and uh, and good night. <laughs>